Can I start with a, asking you a question? How many people here are currently teaching the Myth and Religion GCSE? How many, so that's about four. How many people are planning to but haven't yet done it? That's most of the other. How many people who are teaching it are thinking seriously about stopping teaching it because it's all too much? <laughs> Your or, or school is. Um, this particular myth and religion or, okay. So what I wanted to use this session for is to, some of this will be very familiar to some of you, some of this won't be familiar to you, to try and just go through the material or bits of the material um, and, and, and sort of see what, what, what's there to be interesting if, um, if you haven't thought about this, um, possibly to get your feedback on, on what does work. Um, one thing that strikes me from the start is quite how much material there is for, um, for myth and religion. Basically, this is a visualization of the entire um, set text, um, uh, and it doesn't include anything that's not um, compulsory, as it were. Uh, so you've got the, the eight um, elements and, or units, and of those eight, festivals and death and burial don't actually have set texts in this um, uh, set for them. Uh, the others do. Some of them, it seems to me, slightly odd choices of what's there and what's not there. Uh, but I think actually there's, there's enough material that you, you can sort of play around with it and do more than, uh, or, or, or use some of the other material in, in different ways. But I just thought I would sort of, I mean, this is part of the process that I went through in looking at the, uh, the syllabus uh, and what I thought of it. Um, rather than going through it element by element, uh, or sort of section by section, just to, to group the material together. So we've got these six um, texts, uh, the Homeric Hymn to Demeter, uh, which comes in a couple of times, uh, two bits of, of its metamorphoses, um, including my favorite bit of all, which is the beginning of Book 10. Um, and I'm only sad that you don't get the beginning of book 11 as well to go with it. Um, another very short Homeric hymn, a little extract from Virgil, uh, from Aeneid, um, and bits of Plutarch and, uh, and Livy. Accompanied by places or tem a, a group of temples chosen, I think, primarily, or in most cases, because they're the most temple-looking temples around. Uh, I think there's, there's, there's clearly more of an interest in things that make sense um, visually uh, rather than necessary. I mean, well, Parthenon is an obvious choice under any circumstances. Uh, the Roman ones less so. So we have the Parthenon. We have the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, uh, which now at least has one column standing, uh, part of the... Um, Athens Olympic legacy. And then we've got uh, much less, as it were, literarily discussed temples, um, or places in Rome, the, the Temple of Portunus, um, and probably at least for, in post classical periods, the most famous Roman temple of all, the Pantheon. And then a couple of um, other Roman objects, the Ara Parcis and the Prima Porta Augustus. I'm assuming that most of you were here for Dominic's talk, um, and therefore you know far more about uh, the Ara Parcis and the Prima Porta Augustus than I do. So if I'm not, the, the, uh, most of what I'm going to talk about is going to be more Greek than Roman, uh, but that's partly because of my expertise, but as I say, also because Dominic has already done uh, work on that for you. And then, um, oh, sorry, wrong way. There are sort of three more visual things. There's uh, this kylix showing uh, labors of Theseus. 
There are the uh, metopes from the Parthenon, uh, rather um, fragmentary, but basically enough there that you can see what's going on. And then the metopes from the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. Here, some of these are so fragmentary um, that what I said about them choosing uh, things where you can see what's going on doesn't quite work for this, although um, it's easy to find reconstructions. So that's sort of the, the overall um, syllabus, as, um, as I see it. Again, sort of reading through this and reading through the specimen paper on the OCR website, uh, possibly the initial attempts to turn this into exam papers have not been the most thrilling. Um, I mean, the questions that they've asked, I think, are in some cases a little bit um, odd, but I think they, they, they do work. I mean, there, there is potential, and I'm sure in future years uh, a lot of interesting questions will be asked about this material. Um, one of the things that strikes me about it is um, the way that actually, uh, although as I said, these different things are set to, um, to deal with, with, with the various um, different sections of the, um, of the unit, uh, so you've got um, the, I say, the Homeric hymn to Demeter is the only thing for the gods. Um, you've, you've got the Temple of Zeus and the Metopes in two different uh, sections, the Parthenon and Metopes separated again from the Parthenon. But obviously, they, there is some thought gone into having related material coming back. And one can sort of take that even further, um, think about Theseus, um, one of the, so, so Theseus um, comes in uh, myth and religion. But as, the, um, as is fairly obvious, and, 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 and certainly as the textbook uh, helps to point out, a lot of the labors of Theseus, well, the whole notion of the labors of Theseus, modeled on the labors of, of Heracles. So the, the universal hero, Heracles, gets a sort of look in here, but there are other places where Theseus turns up. Um, the, the Parthenon uh, metopes are all uh, about the, the one that's in the British Museum, about the Lapis and Centaurs. That's an episode where Theseus um, takes, uh, has a role. Um, the uh, journey to the underworld, again, Theseus is one of the heroes who goes to the underworld um, and is met by um, by Heracles, while Her when Heracles goes down. So at least, uh, sort of, it, it, it seems to me that you've, you've got material here that can be used in a variety of ways to, uh, to, to, to feed off each other. So it does, it's a sort of, it's more coherent than it, it, it seems to me than it looks first time. Um, I thought, uh, what I thought I would do um, to take you, or to, 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 to think about some of these, is to talk about one or two uh, things about these that, that, that particularly appeal to me, um, and one or two sort of things that you can do with um, the material, uh, or think about the material that, that, that may be things that you're familiar with or may not be. To start with, um, these are my favorite, um, let me put it this way, favorite bits of relief sculpture that I know of, for, for one very particular reason. I mean, it's worth noting, first of all, if you read the, the list of Heracles' labors in, in here, you'll find it's not this order. Um, what they use here in the book, they take the, um, the text from Apollodorus's Library of Mythology uh, and, and give you a summary of that. This is the, uh, the order in the Temple of Olympia. The first six 
uh, on the west pediment, and the last six are on the east pediment. Uh, there's no, I mean, there's a sense in which um, Apollodorus' uh, sort of um, narrative does hold together. Uh, I mean, both start with the Nemean lion because you've sort of got to do that. One of the interesting, th the, the reason I particularly love this, are you aware of how the passage of time is shown in these sculptures? Give me one. Yeah. I don't think that's right. I think Heracles looks more or less the same all the way through. No, that's not what I would have said. I think there's a much more interesting, which is why I love these things. Who else is visible apart from Athene? All right, that's come out rather dark. The, so Athene appears in number one, the Nemean lion, number three, the Stymphalian birds, number 10, the apples of the Hesperides, and number 12, the Augean stable. And if you look, and as I say, I'm sorry, this, this number one has come out rather darker than it looks on my uh, laptop screen. She is the one who ages throughout these. So you have the very young girl um, in the first one. She's still quite young, but slightly more mature in the second. And the trouble is we don't have the rest of her body in the first one, so it, it, it's a bit difficult to know in detail. Um, her, her form of dress is more, and her, her hairstyle more mature in the third one. Um, and then uh, she's sort of fully adult in, in the final one. So at, what the artist, the, it's, uh, it seems to me that Heracles, was whatever other, I mean, art history is about perception. Heracles seems to be remarkably static, I mean, similar all the way through. But as I say, uh, it, I mean, and he's bearded all the way through. There's no youthful, unbearded Heracles um, who becomes an important figure um, in, the, in the fourth century in particular. But as I say, Athena does, it does age um, noticeably over the course of these labors. It's an interesting notion of a goddess changing age and does sort of raise questions about um, how you envisage God. I mean, Athena bursts fully formed from the head of Zeus, and yet um, this uh, artist wants to uh, present her in a different way. Um, this leads on to another issue, sort of relating this back to the general issue of the God. There are 12 labors of Heracles. What else are there 12 of? Hmm? Gods. Right. Do we know who the 12 gods are? Put your hand up if you could name, list the 12 gods. Put your hands up high. Show your confidence. One, two, three, four. I wonder if you would give me, all give me the same answer. You probably would if you've been, because you'll have read this, and therefore you'll think that that's the answer. Then the idea of 12 gods is clearly important. One of the important places in the Athenian Agora is the altar of the 12 gods. Um, also called in antiquity the altar of pity. It's a place where if you were wanted to, to, to be a suppliant and seek asylum in Athens, this is where you would um, aim to, to go. So people assume the Athenians knew, you know, uh, altar of 12 gods. We must have a list of 12 gods. So here is a list of Olympian gods. Count them. Fourteen. Now, here's an interesting fact. If you study the early books of the Bible, 
you will come across an important uh, phenomenon, which is the, the creation of the 12 tribes of Israel. If you look at the book of Numbers, good name for a book, it will list the 12 tribes, and they are the 12 sons of Jacob. If you look at the later books of the Bible, you will find there are 12 tribes, but two of them are the sons of Joseph, and two of the, uh, two of the, uh, and Joseph and one of the other sons of Jacob are not the um, eponyms of the 12 tribes of Israel. So actually there are 14 tribes of Israel named in the Bible. What's the other famous 12 in the Bible? 12 apostles. So how many apostles do you think there are named in the Gospels? 14. Don't know why, it's complete chance, but everywhere you go, if you're looking for, um, for, for, for 12 gods, you find 14. Where do you find the 12 gods, as you were if, you were, if you were to look for a representation of the 12 gods in Athens, where would you point to? Parthenon Freed. The Parthenon Freed. Okay, here's a question. Count them. How many gods can you see? So bear in mind that, they, that th those aren't gods and those aren't gods. How many can you see? Have we got a number? Twelve. Anyone, any advance on twelve? I can see fourteen. So we have, and I can never remember who all of them are, um, but God, that's Dionysus, um, God, God, Iris, Hera, seven. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, Eros, seven. So 14. Okay, only, six, only 12 of them are sitting down. But it's worth, it's worth thinking that the notion of 12 God, I mean, what the point about this um, that I think is important, if we go back to... Um, the altar of the 12 gods. Clearly, for Athenians and for Greeks more widely, and as I would suggested from the other examples, uh, more widely across the, um, the ancient world, 12 is an important number, a valuable number. Why might 12 be a good number? Um, it's not particularly magic, I don't think. There are more magical numbers than 12. Hmm? You could, so you can divide it in two, you can divide it in three, four, six. Yes, yes, yes. Anything else? Hmm? Architecture? Posit There's something more basic that is part of our world and was part of their world. Hmm? Months. So although lunar months don't fit quite into it, the normal thing would be to have 12 months. So having 12 months, um, which I think are not directly related to the gods, um, provide, makes 12 an important number, a useful number. But as you say, it's got all these other, other valuable properties. So having 12 of something, in a sense, is more important than the question of, of who those 12 are. And that's, that's sort of something worth exploring. So you are confidently told here um, that there are 12 Roman equivalents of the 12 Greek gods. Uh, there are, in some literary context, I think it's, they're far less important um, for Romans. 
but uh, this is but but having 12 of something um, is is sort of um, considered to be of use. Um, let's look at one other thing briefly uh, as a sort of last challenge to orthodoxy, which will then bring us back. Persephone, um, Underworld Journeys and Twelve Gods, the Homeric Hymn to Demeter is important. Um, and one of the passages mo of most interest, um, I think, is the description of Persephone's, or what happened to Persephone in the underworld. And this is Demeter um, interrogating her on her return from the underworld. If you did eat, you'll go back again to the depth of the earth to live for a third part of the seasons each year. The other two parts, however, you shall live alongside me and the other immortals. When earth blooms with fragrant blossoms of spring of every kind, then from the murky dark again you will rise up a great marvel to gods and mortal men. So here we have a, a vase, an attic vase, showing um, Hermes bringing uh, Persephone or Cori back from the underworld uh, to be greeted by Hecate and Demeter. So for the author of the Homeric Hymn to Demeter, it's very clear that Persephone's return is associated with the spring. Persephone's time in the underworld is associated with the, the winter. Um, and we have this notion of the murky dark, which is a sort of in um, discussions of, of, sort of the underworld. To do uh, ones that are associated with, with Eleusis in particular, the Eleusinian mysteries, they tend to talk about the murky dark of the underworld. And it's sort of a cold, uh, foggy place. But is that the only possible explanation of the four months of the year that Persephone is uh, in the underworld? Because I want you to think about a phenomenon that we know more from the Bronze Age than from later, but it, it's not unique to the Bronze Age. It carries on in the early Iron Age. What do you do? So, so harvest in June, let's say, grain harvest. What do you do with the grain between June when you harvest it and um, the autumn when you're, when you're plowing, September, October, when you're going to be uh, plowing the, the seed corn back for the next year? So where do you store it in the, in the meantime? Underground. In either in large stone-walled sort of pits, and we have those from Bronze Age palaces, or in smaller but still large storage shelves. So if you think about, and how many people have been to Greece in August? Is it a fertile, rich, green place? It is pretty dry. I once, um, today is a good day for um, remembering this, uh, when I was an undergrad, uh, uh, when I was a graduate student, I did some field survey in Greece. This is where you walk along in a straight line with people on either side looking for potsherds on the ground. Um, and the day that we uh, surveyed uh, uh, Orkomenos, I think it was, the temperature was 47 in the shade. Um, the one thing about field survey is that you're not in the shade. So, yeah. It's Greece in the summer is a barren place. Um, field survey happens then because all the crops have been harvested and the fields are therefore bare. What else do you use pithoi for? Well, this is a Minoan pithos burial. Um, you do get ch more commonly ch child burials, but you also get adult burials um, in pithoi. So maybe, is, so this association with burial in pithoi um, storage of grain in Pithoi underground means that maybe we should be thinking about the time that Persephone spends in the underworld as being the heat of the summer rather than the cold of the winter. And it's fairly, I think it's clear that some readings of the story, we, we tend to focus on the Homeric hymn because that's the best known and the earliest, uh, but some stories uh, recommend this. 
But thinking about that then took me back to 12 Labors of Heracles, the universal hero, because what do you see in the picture on the um, bottom right? You're, you're, exactly. And where is the pithos? Buried on the ground. This is, you can see the ground level. Some, some illustrations of this have, have a sort of pithos uh, that's, that's standing above ground. But this is sort of not atypical in show. And there are several other versions. And actually, the, um, the version on the uh, Olympia Metope similarly has a buried pithos. So, this no, so maybe what Erysius is doing, um, or this representation of, of Erysius, he is sort of uh, as much in the world of the dead by being buried in the pithos as, as, um, uh, as anything else.